Bloom, Buddhist Reflections on Serenity and Love by Ajahn Sona. Chapter 13, The Four Quarters Last night I talked fairly extensively about metta, and I will stay on that theme this evening because I think it's very important as a tactic or shape to a 10-day retreat. It's like running a marathon where there are times when certain activities, certain approaches are appropriate and should be used. I talked about just arriving, spending a few days not making too many demands on yourself, recognizing you will take some time to adjust to a new environment. Treat yourself kindly and wisely to adjust to that. If you were flying across to Thailand or someplace far away, you would have a natural period of adjustment, a time adjustment. So when you're going to the world of a meditation retreat, it is a different world. I would say it's at least as much adjustment, or more so, than going into a different culture, depending on whether you're immersed in this kind of lifestyle all the time or not. Even for monks, there are different energies and tempos to different periods of monastic life. Some are intensely meditative, and others are more free, with more conversation, more work, and things like that. When you come to setting aside a lot of time for meditation, you should expect that it's a different environment, a different set of skills and different processes. In the beginning, we expect to be adapting. Make sure that your energy remains up and that you don't try to stop on a dime. Then in the middle, which we're in now, it's good to rouse the warm emotions. Earlier, I heard a little bit of laughter downstairs, which is good. It's that laughter and relaxation, smiles and so forth, that are all positive emotions. We have to be skillful with this process because the mind is a delicate thing and it could easily pick up the wrong message. The mind is like a child in some ways. If you use the wrong tone or you look at it the wrong way, it may perceive that something is wrong or that there's some sort of grim situation. In fact, you might be walking around with that on a daily basis. It's not easy to see our default mode all the time. We have a mode that we slip into very easily, and quite often in the West, that mode is rather serious, grim, and self-critical. It's very important that we recognize that. This is one of the functions of our mindfulness. It's not easy to see your own emotional default mode, Because you can't compare yourself to somebody else. You can't switch bodies for a while and see what it's like to walk around in somebody else's mind or emotional structure. You may not even be aware that there is a level of solemnity with which you are conducting your life, which is simply not necessary. It doesn't have to be that way. I think that we should at least assume that's probably the case, that the baseline emotional structure is not good enough This is one of those things where the criticism is not to be internalized, but it's a good thing to just assume that there's some room to go upwards, to rise, to expand the heart, to increase the quality of lightness, ease, and joy. The reduction of an oppressive, constant sense of anxiety is a good thing. We have to recognize that in retreat, you can do that. In retreat, you can just ask yourself, Am I nervous or anxious or worried about anything? Do I worry whether my sitting is all right? Am I showing up enough? Should I be doing more walking? Am I behaving all right in the monastery? Am I getting used to the situation? Checking and noticing this kind of anxiety is the upper level of it. Then checking downwards, and I think at the bottom, the third level down or so, About here is where you'll run into the anxiety around your death. At some level, it's very hard not to be anxious whatsoever because when you're free of any kind of symptomatic situation, no particular demands, there is always this one left. It probably hit you when you were about four or five years old. You suddenly realized you were going to die. And that's what it is to be a human you can realize that you're going to die. 
You might have asked your mother about the whole thing, too. Just to be sure you were right, you asked, Am I going to die? She said, Yes, dear, but not for a long time. That's the nature of humanity, that there is this level. Of course, we want to break through and ultimately free ourselves from anxiety over that as well. That would be true freedom. We have to work skillfully at this when we contemplate things like the default mode of how we conduct ourselves through life. We ask how we feel. Notice the worries, the anxieties, the dullness, the boredom, the uncertainties, even about the practice. Notice your attitude to life. All these things need to be addressed. What you need to do in life, the practicalities, how to arrange your finances and your relationships, and a proper approach to a good philosophy of life. These are valid things to do, but one of the great things about the Buddha's teachings is that he is just so wise. He says, before you do these contemplations, make sure that you've prearranged some emotions so that you address these things in a certain state of mind, in a certain state of emotion. If you do this, you'll get much different answers about what you should do and what you should think and what you should feel. That is the value of the Brahma Viharas. Tonight we chanted the four sublime abidings radiated to the four quarters. The Brahma Viharas set you up in an optimal emotional state, ready for dealing with the issues of being a human, alive. And particularly being a human alive at this time, in this place. You need the best resources you can get in order to answer these questions both the mundane questions, the little questions, the middle-sized questions, and the deeper questions. The Buddha arranges the path in this order, leading up to something called mindfulness and bridging on to serenity. These are not divorced from insights. These are really integral to lucidly seeing and understanding. You can't divorce understanding from the emotional contexts. That's why, in doing a retreat, think of it as time well spent to arrange your emotional structure so that you feel well and light. Your head is free, your heart is warm. You've forgiven yourself and others. You aren't carrying any burdens. This is so important. You can't afford not to, because if you don't, you easily put the wrong emphasis on things. You might have a set of ideas. They're all right, but you color them heavily in one way or the other. You emphasize one and you forget about the others. It's a well-known feature of the human mind to distort things through emotions. Knowing this, the Buddha is giving us some methods for helping us see things in a balanced and realistic way to end up feeling liberated. Any liberation worth having is a liberation of feeling, a liberation of emotion. The heart is liberated from its burdens. That's where you feel it, not just the mere intellect. That's the difference here from academic philosophy, certain of the attitudes that people have towards life. They make rational scientific descriptions of reality. However, if you ask them how they feel, and if they're honest, they'll say, you know what, I don't feel any better. While at the same time, they're still insisting they have a vision of reality. The Buddha is not satisfied with that. He is brilliant. The thought processes, the use of logic and all these things, he's absolutely adept at that. He's not a mystic who can't think clearly. He can do all those things, and he does them very well. But he also has another level of the game, which not all people who can think have access to. He recognizes the role of the emotions and the existential reality that this life is passing by. And how do we feel in it? It's just terribly important that we not feel sorrowful. The Buddha would say it's not a matter of reason, it's a matter of feeling. And feeling is infallible. It's always the right thing to do to uplift the heart. That is the process. And this is what you're radiating in each of the quarters to each of the quarters' beings.
Now, this radiation to the four quarters is different from what I talked about last night. I talked about specifics last night, and we need every technique we can get. So one of the things that the Buddha talks about is particulars. Beings who are just born, babies, not even born, still in the womb. Those who are old, those who are far away, those who are close, large, middling, small. He's giving examples of individual beings. Those who are not so nice, not so good, you're radiating to them also. Those were individual examples, and it's a very good way to start to find your way in easily. I want to reemphasize here that quite often metta is taught as though you just push your way through the resistances. You indiscriminately radiate loving kindness to those you have a lot of troubles with. But usually you just can't do that. I'd say the Buddha never suggested that you try, that you frustrate yourself or make yourself feel guilty trying to do things that you can't do. As a skillful teacher, he would have said you need to find a way in and then expand it out. Then, when you reach your limits and you find it dying, retreat. Retreat back to sustaining the emotion. That's part of right effort, by the way, to make sure that you don't enter into unwholesome emotions. The Buddha doesn't ask you to go into situations which produce the hindrances, the negative emotions. Right effort is to abandon unskillful mental states that have arisen and to avoid unwholesome mental states that have not yet arisen. So when you're trying to cultivate these emotions, if you find yourself at a wall or at a difficult place, Watch whether you feel the positive feelings starting to wither and fade. If that happens, then say, right effort. I shall avoid that. That's too difficult for me. I need to go back to sustaining and cultivating. And if I need easier objects to work with, then that's what I'll do. The four sublime abidings and the radiation to the quarters is another different way to cultivate metta a very general way this time. There are no particulars. It's just all beings to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. It's very impersonal, and that can work well as another way of approaching it. There's no individuality. You're not thinking specifics here. You're just making a large sweeping kind of gesture. There's this vague feeling of masses of beings, not focusing on any individual characteristic, masses of beings for which you wish well. And then the next category, masses of beings who are suffering and you wish them well. Then there are masses of beings who are actually quite happy and you wish them well too. May they enjoy that happiness and may it be prolonged. And then finally, there are masses of beings who are both suffering and happy. And that's how life is, how reality is. But we are free to be at ease with that fact. That's equanimity. The last of the sublime abidings, the last of the Brahma Viharas, radiating it out. Radiating equanimity. When I first thought of radiating equanimity, it was a difficult idea. What are you radiating towards beings and towards yourself? All beings are the owners of their kamma, or karma in Sanskrit. You are to receive that information and that vision with a profound and lovely sense of knowing this is the truth. This is the way it is. There's no point in arguing about it. And yet, I'm allowed to be completely at ease in this reality. That requires a lot of wisdom And it's a subtle emotion. It's not necessarily full of warmth. It's full of some sort of profound contentment, profound ease and profound stability. Because you really are face to face with the truth. Without denying reality, you're allowed to see how it is and at the same time feel well. Note that that includes yourself. All beings are the owners of their kama, including you. Everybody's got kama. You know those things you did. And it's nice to know that you can look at them with ease. It's not required of you to worry about them 
or to regret them. It's also not required that you fear for yourself because you will have a future with comic consequences in it. Notice, it's likely that you will have some problems with the body, some difficulties with people. These are just inevitable aspects of kamma. The Buddha himself had a sore back and fairly regular run-ins with people who were quite abusive. And remember his last meal as well. He died after food poisoning. If the Buddha had to go through this kind of stuff, we certainly would be fortunate not to have to deal with any of it. We will have to deal with that stuff. But can you be equanimous? Can you find that place to stand in the midst of this? Can you find that balanced place? It's so valuable because when we displace worry and fear and anxiety with loving kindness, it is so nice. When we look around at reality, including the reality of our own lives and our future, it would be nice to be able to just acknowledge it. Yes, there could be a few failures ahead, and pain in the body, and so forth. But I feel that I can know that as a possibility, to reflect on that without losing it and swinging off into anxiety and worry and fear. That's why equanimity is such a profound emotion people often take quite a bit of time to truly understand the value of it. There's a profound freedom to feel that you can be in touch with reality, but in the right way. Lots of people advocate reflecting on reality, the harsh realities of life, but that's not really the way the Buddha was advocating. He's not into denial of it either. He's just saying that it's very important you set up the emotional structure first before you bring these realities up, the contemplation of anicca, dukkha, anatta, and the five subjects for frequent recollection, illness, aging, death, loss, and kamma. These are all to be brought up and contemplated, but only in the right context, where they don't bring with them the wrong and unwholesome emotions. And again, that's part of what we're talking about in right effort. Right effort is the launching point for the true contemplative part of the path, right mindfulness and right concentration, leading to wisdom and realization. You're setting yourself up for these things. Right effort says, don't do this if you're swimming in the psychic hindrances or the emotional irritants. You haven't understood it yet. That's what your mindfulness is for, to take you through that state. When you come out on the other side of the foundations of mindfulness, you come out without the hindrances. And now you're a true contemplative. At that point, you're in a position to contemplate effectively. While the hindrances are active, the irritants are active, you are not in a position to see clearly. It's a very nice, beautiful fact that these two things arise together. The serene, joyful, focused mind and the capacity to see accurately arise together. Serenity and insight. Samatha vipassana deliver the accurate messages of the state of reality, and they're really entwined. That's the value of these suttas on the sublime abidings, the positive and most beautiful of the emotions. The Buddha knows that you need all these structures if you're going to transition out of the ordinary conditioned process of the world, which is pretty skimpy on true happiness. There's not a lot of calories there sometimes. You can starve. So the Buddha is saying, I want you to transition out of that, but you need food. You need substance. You need food for the heart. And when you gain your strength, you're going to be able to see. Just think about that period after he is a starving mendicant. He couldn't do anything. He was too weak, and he realized that. I have got to eat something. I can't think. I'm starving. I'm weak. So before he gets down to business, he eats. One has to contemplate these stories again and again and again. They're not just on the physical plane. They're not just literal events. There's a lot of symbolism. In order to do your work as a contemplative, you need nourishment. Remember that the nourishment he got was very beautiful. It was very finely made food, elaborately processed milk rice, 
beautifully offered in great generosity. What a lovely thing. And so your milk rice is the sublime abidings. Just like the Buddha coming out of starvation, we're giving up the lack of nutriment in the ordinary world, the thin soup of sensory happiness, and we're moving towards much more sustaining food. So we're setting you up for the preliminaries, then the arc of the retreat, understanding the value of nourishing yourself and using your imagination and your memory to cultivate this emotional sustenance. Then you'll be in a position to see with clarity, to do the work of insight, and it won't be grim and dry. It will be filled with the context of positive emotion. You'll be looking at impermanence, insubstantiality, and the unsatisfactory nature of immersion in the purely sensory world, the transient world. You'll be aloof from all that. You'll be able to see it in the right context, and it will make sense. Do you notice if you discuss Buddhist ideas with people without them being already persuaded of the idea that they tend to run in the other direction or argue with you about it? At first, it sounds pretty grim, even for you, until you understand that you're changing your diet here, that you're not just going into a fast. You're transitioning into a different, much more satisfactory kind of food for the road. When you explain things like anicca and dukkha and anatta to yourself, it shouldn't be a repulsive experience. It shouldn't be a frightening experience. It shouldn't be any of those things. It should be accompanied by this other nourished, heartfelt structure. So in cultivating loving kindness or the sublime abidings, you have two possibilities. You can use either the particular, the single object, or the multiple objects which are identified so that you can see them lucidly in your mind or in your memory. Or you can use the general sweeping, the large sweeping one, Ask yourself, which one would be better for me at this time in my practice? Is my mind getting tired of focusing on the individual that I like? Then it may be best to just feel the sweeping vision. You see, the Buddha is giving you some imaginative techniques for this, and he recognizes that the mind does it in two ways. It does it on the individual basis and on the vast universal scale as well. So ask, which one am I inspired by? Which one appeals to me more? Which one is better for me now? You can't hurt yourself with either one. This is one of the things the Buddha did say about metta. Of all the practices, it's one of the safest. Mm-hmm.